sound guy. All right, did you hear? I turned it off, not the sound guy. That was me. Hey, thanks for that warm welcome. I didn't even say who I was, but she already said who I was. So we're so glad that you guys are here. All the glory goes to God, though. Amen. And uh, we're so glad whether you join us here in the sanctuary or maybe uh, you joined us online. We're so glad that you are here as we are continuing our message series called Journey to the Empty Tomb. Now, a year ago or so, Tina and I were home. It was late. We were headed off to bed. I mean, it had to be at least 7.30. Um, anyways, when all of a sudden we heard a couple loud bangs, it was like, bang, bang. And it sounded like it was coming from our backyard. And, and so I run to the window and I hear again, bang, bang. Now, about 20 minutes earlier, Tina and I were on social media and we had seen a post where the local PD was searching for two possibly armed suspects that were involved in some crime on the Berlin Turnpike. Now, our property, we have woods in the back of our house and it, and it, and it ends at a back parking lot of a business that's right off of the Berlin Turnpike. Okay, so my mind starts racing, and I'm thinking these armed guys, they must, have, they must have ditched the car in the back parking lot. They're running through the woods, and the cops are chasing them, and they're having a shootout, and they're headed towards my backyard. And so I did what any man of the house would do. I said, honey, could you go out and check the backyard <laughs> to see if it's safe? No, I didn't do that. But what I did do is I flipped on, I got these big floodlights in our backyard. I picked on the, these big floodlights, and then in my, I made my best fighting stance that I learned from Cobra Kai. <laughs> now, I do want to show you what our faithful dog, Ruger, did. I have a picture here. This is his fighting stance, okay? Through the entire crisis, okay, he's laying on the chaise lounge not growling or barking or not even looking in the direction of these loud bangs that are happening. But I do think that he yawned. <laughs> the drama continued for another minute or so, and then it went quiet. The next morning, Tina and I, we, we took our heroic guard dog out for a walk. <laughs> and as we did, we bumped into some neighbors who told us that the loud banging was from a car that was backfiring several times in a street just behind us. So admittedly, my theory about the noises was just a tad off. Today, we're going to be in John chapter 12, a passage in the Bible that really contains one of the few times that we, we hear of an audible voice of God from heaven. It was a loud sound, and the people who heard it immediately started creating theories as to what this sound was. One group said, it must be thunder. Another said that it must be an angel that is speaking to Jesus, but no one seemed to say what really was the case, it wasn't thunder, it wasn't an angel, it wasn't gunshots, it was God. This moment in John chapter 12 is just one of over 40 key events recorded in the last week of Jesus's life. If you add to that the, all the parallel accounts in the, uh, of the 40 events across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's actually 115 passages of scripture or 115 sermons to preach. Come on now. All right. And so far we've preached through like 17 of the 150. I know because I have a spreadsheet, okay? <laughs> Spreadsheets are your friend. So it's going to take some time to work through this, but you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it to take this journey through the events that lead up to the most important event of human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important in the Bible. Events that not only shape history, but change the destiny of billions. We began our journey last week when we zoomed into John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26, when some Greeks came looking for Jesus. These Greeks were seekers who actually turned out to be a sign. They were a sign that Jesus is not just a Jewish Messiah. They were a sign that Jesus is for everyone. And so they said to the disciples, they said, we want to see Jesus. A call 2,000 years later that every believer 
still needs to answer, right? Because we have a lost and dying world out there who is crying out, we want to see Jesus. So I asked everyone last week, how will you show them? And we explored how we can show Jesus to our family, our friends, our coworkers, and our classmates as being part of Lifeway Church. And if you want to watch that message, by the way, you can go out to lifewaych.com and you just click on messages. It's going to be at the top of the page because it was just last week's. And we left off at verse 27. So if you're in your Bibles, we're going to be picking up John chapter 12, verse 27. And, And there's a major shift that's happened here. There's a tone shift And we see a very vulnerable and a very human Jesus in this moment. Jesus says this, verse 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it, they had had said it thundered, or others said an angel had spoken to him. So this booming sound launches opinions and launches all these multiple opinions, but they're all wrong. But notice Jesus doesn't even get into the debate about their opinions about what this is. Instead, he redirects to what matters, verse 30. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. The voice was a signal. It was a a sign to stop doubting and start believing. Jesus didn't need reassurance. Actually, he answered his own prayer. If you look at verse 27, Jesus didn't need reassurance. He answered his own prayer. He and the Father are one. Verse 31 Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Verse 34. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Now, when Jesus spoke about his impending death and his resurrection, basically it fell on deaf ears because the crowd couldn't wrap their heads around this idea of a dying Messiah. It it didn't fit into their paradigm. It didn't fit into their expectations. It's like, you know, when someone posts on social media something that kind of goes against popular opinion, what do people like to say? They say, nah, nah that doesn't fit with our narrative, right? This is kind of this is kind of how people are doing. People wanted a political messiah who who would bring political solutions, but Jesus was offering an eternal kingdom that ironically would only come through his own death. Listen, we need to be really, really careful when we expect God to do things that we think he should do. If you're trying to force Jesus into your own mold, he won't fit, and you'll miss him. So I ask you today, what kind of savior are you seeking? Are you seeking the Jesus that is represented in, in four ancient biographies called Gospels, accounts that were, uh, that were compiled in the first century by eyewitnesses? Or is it the Jesus that's in your head? Maybe that's part Bible, but also part TikTok, and part a teacher that you once had who said something about Jesus. And, 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 and it's very, very mixed up with your own pet peeves and priorities and politics and opinions. Because here's the thing, it's only the Jesus who defies our expectations, the eternal Son of God who is revealed in the Scriptures. He is the only one that has any power to save you. Not the one, not the Jesus that you make up in your head. Verse 35, then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. While walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light 
while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Tragically, the people of Jesus' day, they thought they had all the time in the world. You see, this is why Jesus is speaking with urgency here. He's saying, listen, you, you will not always have access to the light, so respond. Tragically today, I think we suffer from this still. In fact, we have a name for it. I, I just learned that this, this week. Psychologists call it time discounting. Okay, and it's where, where people mentally discount the value of future rewards compared to immediate desires. And this is a phenomenon that's been studied, and it's really detrimental. Uh, people have difficulty committing. People uh, d- decrease mo- motivation. And then the worst thing is, is they have increased impulsivity, but not in a good way. So they take on risky behaviors, right, uh, whether it's in health or, or finances or the relationships. And, and a peer-reviewed paper in the Journal of Psychology Science said this, people typically place less value on future outcomes than on present outcomes. This tendency, known as time discounting, has been demonstrated in numerous experiments. Here's the thing. Jesus is warning about all this, and he didn't need a degree from Harvard to do so. He's saying, act now before the darkness overtakes you because I have a bigger plan and my plan is an eternal kingdom. What is this darkness, though, that Jesus is talking about? Let's just spell it out. This is the very real forces of spiritual evil that exist in our world. It was in, a pr- in, in the prayer this morning uh, and, and in worship was mentioned um, and the human sin that exists that separates us from God. Those are the two things that represent this darkness that Jesus is talking about. The forces, the forces of spiritual evil as well as the force of sin in our lives that separates us from God. Jesus says, act now before the darkness does what? Overtakes. That's an interesting word. I looked it up in, in Greek. It's katalambano. Uh, I'm saying that more like an Italian um, simply because I can't really speak Greek and that's easier for me. But cantalabano, okay? I'm going to say it like that with your fingers like this. It means to seize. It means to take ownership of. So this is a darkness that is so thick that light cannot penetrate it. Jesus is telling us two things that we need to do to avoid that kind of darkness. Number one, walk while you have the light. We just read it. And number two, believe in the light while you have the light. Do you see that urgency? To escape the darkness, we need to change a couple things. We need to change the way we think, and we need to change our actions. And that brings me to our big idea for today. If you're taking notes, here it is. Overcome darkness by believing and walking in Christ's light. Overcome darkness by both believing and walking in Christ's light. We are to, to change our thinking and our actions. Now, to, to walk is a common Semitic expression in Jesus' day, which really means to live. So the idea, it, it actually strongly evokes the idea of discipleship, to follow. So, so one way of saying it is that we are to believe in and follow the light. But what is the light? What is the light? That's right. See, this is, the, this is the Sunday school answer. You can't get this one wrong. All right? He tells us, right? In, in, in John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light represents not just Jesus himself, but his, the truth and guidance and salvation he offers. So walk while you have light before the darkness overtakes you. Let me try to illustrate that. This is kind of a silly illustration, but this is what I thought of. Let's say you wanted to stay in, the, you're going for a walk, and you wanted to stay in the sunlight and not go get overtaken by the darkness, okay? Do you know how fast you'd have to walk? 1,040 miles per hour, okay? That's some serious speed walking right there and trying to follow the sun and never leave the darkness. Now, if you had a spare 34 million or so, plus some fuel and the maintenance to, uh, you know, to own an SR-71 Blackbird, 
you could keep up with the sun until you ran out of fuel. So unless you're a superhero with super speed, like Dash, he's my favorite from The Incredibles, right? Or you're a billionaire with, that owns a jet that can go over Mach 2 and somehow can stay perpetually in the air. Guess what? You're going to have a hard time staying up with the light. But here's a beautiful thing about Jesus. When you walk with Jesus, you stay in the light even when the world around you gets dark. Why? Because he is the light. Do you see that? Just walk with him at his pace. You don't need to do 1,040 miles per hour because he is the light. And that's why every man, woman, and child can overcome darkness by believing and walking in the light of Christ. Now let's break this down. Uh, A few verses here we're going to look at and discover three truths to help you overcome. The first one is this. Jesus is troubled. Jesus is troubled. You may be thinking, wow, pastor, how does that help me? That sounds like bad news. Verse 27. Astonishingly, Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. Let me walk you through this progression so you can get a picture of what's happening here. The arrival of the Greeks that we talked about before in verse 20 signals that the hour has come. And then that leads Jesus to speak of his death in terms of a a grain of wheat falling to the ground and dying, a powerful metaphor that we explored last Sunday. And then that, in turn, leads Jesus to this moment, to a sense of deep foreboding as he contemplates the horrific death that he's going to face. Now my soul is troubled. Nobody wants to die in the prime of life, and certainly nobody wants to die by crucifixion. Now, my soul is troubled. That's the word who became flesh. That's that's the one who turned water into wine, the one who healed the sick, the one who raised the dead, and he was troubled deep within his soul. My question for you is, is your picture of God big enough for that? Or when God speaks, do you just think it's thundering? The reality is, is that the fact that Jesus was troubled, that means because he was troubled then, we can trust him now. You see, we can believe in him and we can walk in his light because he knows where we are right now. He's twice qualified, of course, as as God incarnate, He possesses all wisdom and knowledge of the universe. And then as man, he walked in our shoes and faced everything that we face and worse. He was misunderstood. He was rejected. He was abandoned and betrayed. People didn't understand him. And the people closest to him hurt him. And now he's facing an unjust, brutal execution. So he is qualified to be the light that we follow. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 4 says it this way. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, our intercessor, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And this is how he can lead you, no matter the situation you're facing. What is his response to trouble? What does he do? He prays. Do you see that? He begins with emotional honesty, and he ends with bold faith. And that is exactly how we're supposed to pray. He gives us the precise example of how to pray. It's a pattern for us to follow. Verse 27 again, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Now, it's interesting to me that John doesn't record Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. Maybe because the other gospels already existed at this point and all three of them had already recorded it. But he uniquely records this prayer that's a couple days before Gethsemane. And to me, though, it reveals the same truth. I see the same 
mix of emotional honesty with bold faith. Both prayers focus on Jesus' re- 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 oh, man, I can't talk. Oh, anyways. <laughs> Jesus' resolve, okay, to do the Father's will regardless of his very real human feelings. This is how we can overcome darkness through following the light, experiencing both unfiltered emotion. Jesus experiences this, and we can express this unfiltered emotion and bold faith in prayer. That's how we overcome. Notice the passage today opens in trouble and ends in triumph. So let me ask you, what lies between the trouble and the triumph in this passage? Did you catch it? In first service, you can't answer. It was the voice of God. Do you see that? Brings us to our next fill-in if you're taking notes. Number two, the Father speaks. The Father speaks. Verse 28, this is what changes the atmosphere of the moment. God speaks. Verse 28, then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. God's voice is what lies between trouble and triumph. This is a pattern that we see all throughout Scripture. I think of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when God speaks his voice from where? From a burning bush. And Moses goes from a person who's in trouble. If you remember his story, he's a person who's on the run, and he is a shepherd that's living in exile to a triumphant leader over the, the biggest empire of the known world at that time, over Egypt. And he is the one who now shepherds his people to freedom from slavery. What stood between his trouble and triumph? It was the voice of God. Think of Samuel. Samuel's mother, Hannah, dedicated him to the Lord, but then he ends up living with, with a corrupt priest, Eli, and, and his wicked sons, if you, if you know the story. But then what happens at night while, while Samuel is lying down in the tabernacle, what happens? God speaks. He speaks to him. And this, scholars will say, is the turning point of, of Samuel's ministry as a, as a prophet and as a judge, and where he would eventually lead Israel to a decisive victory over the Philistines who had stolen the Ark of the Covenant. Even better than Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> and then later, he would anoint a certain young shepherd boy named David, who would one day, as king, of course, would usher an era of prosperity and cultural growth and military strength that Israel had never seen. What is the thing that stood between Samuel's trouble and triumph? It was the voice of God. And that is what stands between your trouble and your triumph. Remember, Jesus said, what he told us, he said, this voice was for your benefit, not for mine. So the voice is for us. Now you may say, well, pastor, come on. How about, I, I don't hear God's voice. How do I hear God's voice? I, I get it. When you, when you pray to God, you may not hear an audible voice. Actually, it's pretty rare even in the Bible. There's only three times in the New Testament that I know that it happens. But here's the thing. He will speak to us every day as his voice is recorded in his word, in Scripture which we have access to. And this is how he speaks triumph into your tension. This is how he speaks triumph into your trouble today, by the word of God. You know, yet our Bibles often sit on the shelves collecting dust. But when you open his divine word, we see Jesus who is the word, right? And he guides us out of our darkness. He guides us into his marvelous light, We can overcome darkness by believing and walking in Christ's light. John 12 reveals three truths that help us overcome. Number one, Jesus is troubled. Number two, the Father speaks. And number three, Jesus wins the victory. Jesus wins the victory. This is a theme. It was through prayers this week, through our our worship. And again, we're not that organized. We don't plan this stuff, guys. Okay, This this is God. Verse 31 says, Now the prince of this world will be driven out. 
The prince of this world is Satan. He's the devil who, who gained a foothold in the world at the beginning of time when, when Adam and Eve rebelled. But you know what? His authority continues today. Why? Because it's through the ongoing corruption and sinful choices of humanity. But this verse can be best understood in light of the next. Verse 32, Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The language here is very intentional. The preposition, here's a little, sorry for the little Greek nerd spasm here I'm going to do. But the preposition from, ek in Greek, means out from rather than away from. From. Okay, what does that mean? So the phrase lifted up from the earth is not only communicating being lifted up above the earth as the cross, but it's also being brought up out of the earth as in the resurrection. You see, because that is how Jesus drives out the prince of this world. His death, his burial, his resurrection. But actually, there's a dual prophecy. There's, there's what I would call a now but not yet uh, prophecy fulfillment here. The first one is fulfilled through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And what happens? The prince of this world is driven out of where? Driven out of the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God is, is what Jesus founded and inaugurated at its first coming. So anyone, if anyone is in Christ today, understand you live in a kingdom where Satan has no authority. None. Zero. So if you're a follower of Christ, the devil only has the power that you give him. But if you're not in Christ, you're in the world, which means you're under his dominion and authority, and you're lost. The second part will be fulfilled at his second coming when Jesus first inaugurates. Now he consummates his kingdom. He's going to come back, and he's going to right every wrong, and he's also going to judge. He's going to judge the living and the dead, and Revelation chapter 20 tells us exactly what's going to happen to the devil. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. We do not need to face the same fate. This is why Jesus is crying out so much here in verse 35. He's saying, walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. And that brings me to our call to action for Dave. If you're taking notes, here it is. Be children of light so darkness cannot overtake you. Be children of light, so darkness can never, ever overtake you. Remember my silly word, cantalambano, okay? <laughs> to seize. Here's the thing. When you become a child of light, darkness can no longer control you. It can no longer take hold of you because you are under the Father's authority. You get that imagery, your child of the light, which means you are under his authority as his child. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 says it this way, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And what are we supposed to do? And well, then find out what pleases the Lord, right? Verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Go, actually, it says to go on and it says to expose them. Okay, because we don't want other people to get tripped up by them, right? Think back to my analogy of the sun. Now consider the fact that the sun is a light and it's always a light. It is, it is seven days a week, 24 hours a day, right? I mean, all month long, all decade long, all century long, it is light. But yet the earth still goes dark each day. Why? Because the earth turns, right? The earth, the earth turns. Hear me. If there is darkness in your life, it is not because God is turning. If there is darkness in your life, it is not because Jesus is turning. It's because you are turning. 
like the sun, Jesus is always shining. And so when you see shadows forming around you, you need to turn to him. You might feel the darkness creeping on like a heaviness. Could be from your life circumstances. For you, I I don't know, maybe someone in here is facing a financial situation or maybe a relationship problem. I I feel led to pray for you guys at the end or a health situation. But you see, when that happens to you, you, you need to turn your focus from that situation to God. You need to turn your focus to Jesus, who is the light of the world. The second way darkness can creep in is when we turn into the direction of some sin or temptation in our life. Real talk here, right? Could be anything you're in bondage to. Could be pornography. It could be substances. It could be less obvious things. It could be selfishness. It could be materialism. How about jealousy, right? Of other, with all social media, with other people's successes and, and their possessions, right? I mean, if I see one more vacation pick, I'm just going to, anyways. <laughs> see, I got to work on it. We're, it's all fueled by people's humble brags out online, right? Uh, by the way, yeah, bragging, that's another one. Fast forward to the end of the chapter. Jesus says this. Actually, Pastor Christine brought this up on our live stream, and I wanted to share it. Verse 46, he says this, I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Somebody say, stay. Stay. So understand, darkness is our default, right? It means that darkness is our default position. So guess what? We need to move. And it all starts with belief. That's why to overcome darkness, we need to believe in and walk in Christ's light. There's an emotional story of a desperate father who comes to Jesus. He's got his son with him. It's recorded in Mark chapter 9. The disciples were unable. His son is, is possessed by a demon, and the disciples were unable to drive out the spirit, and so they stood by helplessly as his son convulsed on the ground, and, and he's foaming at the mouth, and, and Jesus asked the father, how long has he been like this? I picture the father cradling his tormented son in his eye, and in tears that are coming down, and he says, from childhood, In fact, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Jesus had compassion, and he cast this evil spirit out, and and the boy, he convulsed one more time, and then he laid there motionless. The people in the crowd were like, he's dead. And Jesus came up to him, and he picked him up by the hand, and he was fully restored. That day, that boy and his father overcame a darkness that had plagued them for years, for the boy's entire life. And what is so beautiful about that story is that the father's faith was not perfect. It didn't need to be perfect because Jesus is perfect. And even when our belief is not perfect, even when our belief is maybe mingled with unbelief or or our belief is mingled with uncertainty, we can go to Jesus and we can say, Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when we keep our eyes on him, despite the shadows that we face in life, we can overcome the darkness that we face as we walk in his light. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Gracious Father, I thank you, O God, for sending your Son to be the light of our lives. May we always, may we remember even right now that time is short. And may we never be complacent, God. If we have been complacent, God, right now, 
Lord, we wake up. And Lord, you help us to walk while we have the light of Christ before the darkness seizes us. Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us to obey, to turn from the things that take our eyes off of you. May we, as the writer of Hebrews say, throw off everything, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run the race with perseverance. Oh, Lord, I pray for those who are facing a dark circumstance right now. There's somebody in here who's facing a financial mountain that they can't even imagine how to climb. Someone here is facing a relational problem, a health situation. Whatever it is, I invite you, even if you're struggling to believe, to step out in faith and pray this prayer. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for the deep trouble that you faced for me. You have won the victory. Now I ask that your Holy Spirit would come now and rush in like a flood and help me and guide me each day to face Jesus. May your voice lead me from trouble to triumph, from unbelief to belief. And Jesus, may I always walk in your light so that darkness will never overtake me. In your name. As we stay in this moment of prayer, I just want to speak to those who maybe you feel far from God today. You could be in this sanctuary. Maybe you've joined online, but you know that, there's, that, that you are not right with God. Well, that's why Jesus came. He came and he lived the perfect life that you and I could not to become the perfect sacrifice on the cross. And then he rose up on the third day. So he is alive today. So you can call on him. And when you do, when you call on him, when you confess your sins, he will forgive every sin you have ever committed. And he will make you brand new. But I want you to know, our time is limited. And you're not here today. You're not hearing this today by accident. And so I urge you to trust in Christ while there's still time. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. If that's you, if you're willing to say yes to Jesus today, just pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I turn from them and I, and I turn to your son, Jesus. I do a 180 in the road of life and I turn to face your son, Jesus. And so I will walk with you. Today, I give you leadership in my life as my Lord. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you come and fill and equip and empower me to live the life that you have called me to live before this earth was created. Thank you, O oh God, for new life. I give it to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lifeway, let's celebrate what God is doing here in people's lives. I said this in first service and last week, but I just feel to say, if you prayed that prayer, giving your life to Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, the Bible says that angels are rejoicing in heaven because it's a wonderful place that you're stepping into. And we want to help you take those steps with Jesus. So we want to get you um, a free booklet called the New Believer's Handbook. So if you prayed that prayer with me, either rededicating your life to Christ or giving your life to Christ for the first time, I, I, th I think you need this book because this is going to help you take your next steps with Jesus. If you are in the building, you just ask any member of the team, uh, our prayer team up here, um, or the guest service, you can get yourself a copy. If you are joining us online, just simply text the word book to 860-560-1950. We will mail one out to you at no charge. As the worship team is going to lead us here, I'm going to invite you one last